Welcome back to The Deep Dive. Today we are tackling a really key hormone in the fertility world, follicle-stimulating hormone, FSH. Yeah, FSH. It's, uh, it's one of those metrics that can feel pretty significant when you're going through fertility assessments, especially for IVF. Definitely. So our goal today is to kind of break down what those FSH levels are really telling your doctor. Exactly. Why that day three blood test is so important and maybe most interestingly, how clinics actually use synthetic FSH to, well, guide the whole IVF process. Okay, let's start right at the beginning then. FSH. The name kind of gives it away, right? Follicle stimulating hormone. It does. It's the hormone that signals the ovarian follicles, those little sacs holding the potential eggs to, to wake up and start growing each month. And important to mention, it's not just for women. It plays a big role in sperm production for men too. Absolutely. It's fundamental for both. But focusing on female fertility for a moment, that day three timing is key. Right, day three of the menstrual cycle. Why is that specific day so critical for testing FSH? Because that's when your other hormones, like estrogen and progesterone, are naturally low. It's your baseline. Ah, okay. Hmm. So the pituitary gland is just starting its work for the month, and you get a clear picture of its starting signal strength. Precisely. That baseline FSH reading gives us a really valuable snapshot of what we call ovarian reserve, basically. How responsive the ovaries are likely to be. Okay, so let's talk about what happens when that snapshot doesn't look quite average. Let's start with high FSH. That generally signals some kind of issue, doesn't it? It often does, yeah. You can think of high FSH as the pituitary gland, the body's hormone control center having to um, shout to be heard. Shouting because the ovaries aren't listing as well as they used to. Exactly. If the ovaries are becoming less responsive, maybe because of age or what we call diminished ovarian reserve, DOR, the brain senses that the follicles aren't growing like they should. So it doesn't just give up. It ramps up production, sends out more FSH to try and force those follicles to respond. That's the mechanism. It's trying harder. So if your baseline FSH, that day three level, is consistently coming back over, say, 10 or 12 IUL, that suggests diminished reserve. And if it's really high, like over 25. And if it's consistently over 25 IUL, especially alongside low estrogen levels, that points towards premature ovarian insufficiency or POI. Okay, so the bottom line for someone listening is that high FSH can mean fewer eggs available and potentially a poorer response to the standard fertility drugs used in IVF. Generally, yes. It predicts you might need a different approach or higher doses. But, and this is really important. Ah, yes. Context is key, right? FSH isn't the whole story. Not at all. FSH levels can fluctuate a lot. Things like stress, being unwell, even leftover meds from a previous cycle can cause a temporary spike. So one high reading isn't necessarily a final verdict. Definitely not. We always look at trends and repeat tests. Plus, FSH is often a bit of a late indicator. It might only rise significantly when the reserve is already quite low. It's not always the first warning sign. That makes sense. It's like the alarm going off after the fire has already started sometimes. Okay, let's flip to the other side. What about low FSH? If high is the brain shouting, is low the brain <laughs> whispering or maybe not talking at all? Uh, Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Low FSH often suggests the issue isn't with the ovaries, but with the control center itself, mm. the hypothalamus or the pituitary gland. What could cause that? Things like um, significant head trauma, pituitary tumors, or sometimes rare genetic conditions like common syndrome. These can disrupt the signal production. So the command to start follicle growth just isn't being sent out properly. Right. And if the ovaries don't get that FSH signal, the follicles don't develop. This leads to anovulation, no egg release, which obviously prevents natural conception. Are there other situations where FSH might be low? Yes. Interestingly, it can sometimes be seen in polycystic ovary syndrome, mm. PCOS, though the picture there is a bit more complex. Ah, uh, PCOS, always complex hormones. How does FSH fit in there? In classic PCOS, you often see FSH being low relative to another hormone, LH, luteinizing hormone. LH is often high. So the balance is off. Exactly. Huh. That high LH, along with often higher levels of androgens and estrogen, can actually suppress FSH release. So again, the follicles might start to grow, but they stall, they don't reach maturity, leading to an ovulation. So whether it's high or low, an abnormal baseline FSH level is a really important diagnostic clue. Mm, absolutely. It helps pinpoint where the problem might lie. Which brings us to IVF, where clinicians kind of take the reins from the body's natural system using synthetic FSH. This is the controlled ovarian stimulation part, right? Precisely. We're essentially overriding the natural cycle. Normally, your body aims to mature just one, maybe two dominant follicles. But in IVF, the goal is more like 
a whole team of follicles. Exactly. We want quantity and quality. Yeah. The aim is usually to get a cohort of follicles, ideally somewhere in the range of 8 to 15, to mature all at the same time. And you achieve that by giving injections of synthetic FSH. Yes, medications called gonadotropins. You might hear brand names like Gonalef or Menopore. Mm -hmm. They're basically concentrated FSH, sometimes with LH2, given as daily injections just under the skin. That sounds like a powerful intervention. The dosage must be critical. How do doctors figure out how much to give? You mentioned the range is huge. It's incredibly personalized. The daily dose could be anywhere from, say, 75 international units IU, right up to 450 IU per day. Yeah. Sometimes even a bit higher in specific cases. Wow. What determines that? It depends entirely on the individual. We look at age, definitely. We look very closely at AMH levels. We'll talk more about AMH in a bit, antral follicle count on the ultrasound, and really importantly, how someone has responded in any previous IVF cycles. So let's say I have that high baseline FSH we talked about suggesting diminished reserve. Am I likely looking at the higher end of that dosage range? Very likely, yes. For patients considered poor responders or those with known low reserve, we often use a higher dose protocol, maybe 300, 375, even 450 IU daily. Trying to really push those less responsive ovaries. Exactly. We're trying to recruit as many of the available follicles as possible. Yeah. But on the flip side, if someone has a very high ovarian reserve, like many women with PCOS. Then you use a lower dose. Why is that? Primarily to prevent ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, OHSS. That's the main risk we manage during stimulation. Right. OHSS. What happens there? If the ovaries get overstimulated by too much FSH, too many follicles grow too quickly. This can cause a massive hormonal surge. Fluid shifts into the abdomen and chest. It leads to severe bloating, nausea, difficulty breathing in bad cases. Well, that sounds serious. It can be. Mild OHSS is relatively common and manageable, but moderate or severe OHSS requires close medical attention and sometimes means we have to cancel the cycle before egg retrieval to let things calm down. So it's a real balancing act. Enough FSH to get a good number of eggs, but not so much that you trigger OHSS. It's a total tightrope walk. And that's why the monitoring during this phase is so, so intense. Okay, let's talk about that monitoring. How do you keep track? It involves frequent visits to the clinic, usually every two or three days, sometimes daily towards the end. We do two main things, transvaginal ultrasounds and blood tests. What are you looking for on the ultrasound? We're measuring the follicles. We watch them grow aiming for about one to two millimeters of growth per day. The target size for maturity is usually around 17 to 22 millimeters in diameter. Okay. And the blood tests, what are they tracking? Primarily estradiol or E2. Estradiol is produced by the growing follicles themselves. Ah, so rising E2 means the follicles are active and healthy. Exactly. We want to see a nice, steady, strong rise in E2 levels. It confirms the stimulation is working, but if that E2 level shoots up too high, too fast. That's the warning sign for OHSS risk? That's our main biochemical red flag for OHSS, yes. If we see that, we might reduce the FSH dose immediately or consider other strategies to manage the risk. Conversely, if the E2 isn't rising well, we might increase the FSH dose. Very dynamic. It really sounds like managing air traffic control for follicles, guiding them all in for a safe landing. That's a great analogy. And once the lead follicles reach that mature size, and the E2 levels look appropriate for the number of follicles. Then comes the final step. The trigger shot. Yep, the trigger shot. This is usually an injection of a different hormone, either HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin, or sometimes a GnRH agonist like Lupron. And what does the trigger shot do? It mimics the natural LH surge that happens mid-cycle. This surge triggers the final maturation process within the eggs. It's absolutely crucial for getting mature eggs at retrieval. And the timing of that shot is super specific, right? About 34 to 36 hours before the egg retrieval procedure. Spun on. That time frame is critical. It gives the eggs enough time to complete their final maturation division meiosis, but not so long that the follicles rupture and release the eggs spontaneously, which is ovulation. You need them mature, but still contained, ready for collection. Exactly. Ready and waiting in the follicles for the retrieval procedure. Okay, so we've seen how FSH is measured at baseline and how synthetic FSH drives IVF stimulation. But you mentioned earlier that FSH fluctuates and is sometimes a late indicator. It needs backup. It definitely needs context. No good fertility specialist relies only on FSH. It's always part of a bigger picture. And that bigger picture usually includes what? AMH and AFC? The trio? That's right. Anti-Mullerian hormone, AMH, and antral follicle count, AFC, are the other two key players in assessing ovarian reserve. 
Why is AMH often seen as maybe more reliable than FSH, especially for predicting how someone might respond to IVF drugs? Well, AMH is produced directly by the small resting follicles, the antral and preantral ones. So it gives a more stable measure of the total size of the remaining egg pool, the quantity. Ah, unlike FSH, which reflects the brain's effort this month, AMH reflects the underlying supply. Kind of, yeah. AMH levels don't fluctuate nearly as much day-to-day -day or cycle-to-cycle -cycle as FSH does, so it gives us a steadier gauge of the potential number of eggs we might be able to retrieve with stimulation. It correlates better with IVF response. Okay, so AMH is the steady quantity measure. FSH is the pituitary's current signal strength, and AFC, the antral follicle count. That's a direct look. Exactly. The AFC is done via transvaginal ultrasound, usually at the start of the cycle, like the D3 FSH test. We physically count the small resting follicles, usually two 10 millimeters, that are visible on the ovaries. So you see how many follicles are potentially ready to respond to the FSH stimulation that month? Precisely. It's the visual confirmation. So when you put all three together, the pituitary signal, FSH, the underlying reserve marker, AMH, and the count of immediately available follicles, AFC, you get a much clearer, more robust picture to guide treatment. That comprehensive view must be why it's so important to bust that myth. High FSH does not automatically mean you can't get pregnant, especially with IVF. Absolutely. Critical point. High FSH indicates challenges, yes. It suggests lower quantity, but it doesn't say much definitive about egg quality. And quality is arguably more important in the end. Often, yes. IVF success, especially getting a healthy embryo, hinges significantly on egg quality. Even with high FSH, if we can retrieve a few good quality eggs, success is still very possible. We just need the right protocol. Like maybe different types of stimulation, lower doses perhaps? Exactly. Things like mini IVF or antagonist protocols or sometimes focusing on supplements alongside treatment. There are strategies tailored for diminished ovarian reserve. It's not a closed door. You mentioned supplements. Are there lifestyle things or supplements that evidence suggests might help support ovarian health or maybe improve response during that FSH stimulation phase? Yeah, there's definitely growing interest in some evidence, though more research is always needed. Supplements like coenzyme Q10, CoQ10, are often recommended for mitochondrial health, which is vital for egg energy. Okay, anything else? DHEA is sometimes used, particularly in cases of diminished ovarian reserve, though it's controversial and needs careful monitoring. Vitamin D deficiency is common, and correcting it seems beneficial. In general lifestyle, diet, stress. Absolutely. Maintaining a healthy body mass index, or BMI, is important. Yeah. Both being significantly underweight or overweight can disrupt hormones, mm. and managing chronic stress is key too. High cortisol isn't great for reproductive hormones. So it's the whole picture, medical strategy, lifestyle, trying to optimize everything. It really is. Supporting overall health supports reproductive health. This has been incredibly clarifying. FSH is clearly such a central piece of the puzzle, both for diagnosing potential issues with ovarian reserve, and then, critically, as the tool doctors use to guide the whole IVF stimulation process. It really is. It's that initial map reading, and then it becomes the gas pedal during the IVF journey, allowing clinicians to carefully navigate towards the goal of mature eggs. A powerful hormone, indeed. Now, just before we wrap up, we absolutely must state, as always, Always. Yes, it's crucial to remember that everything we've discussed today is purely for educational and informational purposes. It is not and should never be taken as professional medical advice. Please always consult with your own doctor or a qualified fertility specialist for any personal health concerns or treatment decisions. They're the only ones who can provide guidance tailored specifically to you and your situation. And if you are looking for more general information about the entire in vitro fertilization process, one resource you can check out is the portal IVFforMe.com. That's IVFforMe.com. Lots of comprehensive information there. Thanks so much for diving deep with us today. Always a pleasure. We'll catch you on the next Deep Dive.